I grew up in like different places. Mm -hmm. Moved around a decent amount. I moved to Chico the first time when I was four and I went to kindergarten here and then after my sister was born in... I don't remember what year that was, but it was a while ago. I was in like the second or third grade. We moved to Arizona, and then moved to Colorado, and then we moved back here. And mm-hmm. Ta-da! Perfect. We lived out of a little red car called Red Cloud yeah. when I was really, really young. Uh-huh. Really, really, really young, like a baby. I don't remember any of it. So now we get to fast forward from li- the life in the little red car to when I saw you about a year and a half, two years ago. We were sitting at the plaza, and you were actually interviewing Adam. You were doing the right. thing that you used to do with your phone where you take the videos for your, yeah. your movie thing. And I was kind of sitting over there listening to you interview and talk to Adam. And I remember you said to him, man, you know, when I was 16, I was a runaway and I was on the streets and stuff. And I said, high five, me too. And I think that was like one of the first times that I'd ever met you. From there, you know, you and I um, did this really cool interview, which I think I'm going to play on the air, by the way, about cutting. I mean, did you want to share any more on that or any of that time frame in your life? No, that's pretty self-explanatory. That time frame in my life, around that time, I was running away for stupid reasons. Some stupid reasons, some valid reasons. It was just, I was 16. Um, It was kind of a rough time for me, like mentally and emotionally and stuff. But I was on and off the streets for about a year. I moved back in with my dad in January of this year. And I've been living at home ever since. I'm going back to high school and getting my, my diploma. Yeah. Now, how long were you homeless this latest incident? About a year. About a year? A little under a year. A little bit under a year. Mm-hmm. So it seems like I, I knew you most of the time you were homeless. Yep. Yeah. Because that's when I was down here all the time. That's when you would see me around is when I was always at the plaza or Children's Park or somewhere in Chico, just bumming it around, mm-hmm. walking around with my pack and my big dog. And then there was a period, because I know, because we were just kind of communicating on Facebook where you traveled a bit. Yeah, I went up to, through Portland and Seattle. I didn't really stop in a lot of other cities. I, I went through most of the cities between there, kind of just off of the I-5, you know, going up between, you know, Washington and Oregon. But I didn't stay anywhere else other than Portland. I stayed in Seattle for like two weeks, but I didn't stay long. I was in Portland for a very long time. I was in Portland for about five or six months, mm-hmm. off and on. I came back to Chico at one point, and then I went back. So I think it was er, like January, February maybe that I saw you and I knew you were coming back and I asked you how your trip was. And Do you remember what you said? No, it was terrible. You said, how was Portland? I said, I hated it. But you said, uh, the the one thing I do remember, you said, I'm never going to leave Chico. No, I am going to leave Chico actually, but I did say that probably. (laughs) At that point, I was very, very happy to be home. I mean, I went to the coldest place I possibly could have gone for the winter time, which is stupid. It got down to 18 degrees while I was camping in Portland. The The water in the gutters and underneath the food carts was frozen. There's this ice everywhere all over the streets, and it was just so cold and so terrible, and I was so happy to be back in Chico. Yeah. And that's when you went, you went back home to live with your dad? Yep. The day that I came back, it was January 7th. Tell me about being homeless, some of your fears, I mean, some of the things, challenges that you had to deal with. Honestly, the most difficult part of being homeless was being a minor, to be perfectly honest. Um, There's nothing you can do. You can't do anything as a minor regardless of whether or not you're homeless or living in a home. You can't really do anything. You're not really in control of anything because you're still considered a child. And that was really frustrating for me. I would need to go out and do this stuff and get business done and take care of myself, and I just couldn't because I was too young. Um, Being homeless is really difficult, although... I mean, despite what I just said for anybody at any age, it's really just not fun. It was fun at first. I'll give it that. It was really fun at first until it started to get cold and until my back started to hurt and my socks were dirty and they needed to go home, you know? Were you fortunate enough to avoid violence? Um, Yeah. I never got in a fight the whole time I was homeless. I've, I've never been in a fight my entire life. That's probably just me, though. I mean, violence is everywhere on the streets. Violence is everywhere. And I almost got beat up more than once but I didn't ever because I just I didn't I didn't hang out with those people I didn't put myself in those situations and I'm not inflammatory I guess is a word to just that does not describe me (laughs) I first started running away around winter time last year it was about winter 2014 about to be 2015 feeling fed up and trapped and just terrible. It was a time when I was skipping school a lot. I was feeling very stressed out. There were a lot of things that I had to deal with and I was kind of growing up a little bit and I was getting very overwhelmed at that. It's not like I was in a super abusive household either. That's not what was going on. It was just stupid decisions of being young and um, I tried to justify it a lot when I was on the road but honestly I really can't. So you feel like you have a a decent support uh, network with your dad? Uh, My dad's been really awesome. The whole time that I was homeless I would call him and we'd check in and um, he was really great. 
welcoming me, welcoming me back home with open arms and taking care of me and helping me get back enrolled in school and helping me get all the stuff that I need and encouraging me to go out and get jobs and things like that. And, you know, paying out of pocket 100 bucks a week for me to go see a therapist and stuff like that. He's been really great. Yeah, I really appreciate my dad. That's kind of validating to know that you can you you left, you came back, and it was like unconditional love, and he's helping you get back. Totally, yeah. I wasn't expecting that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What were you expecting? Um, a different reaction, some sort of disownment, disappointment. I mean, he was definitely disappointed, but never at any point did he stop offering me things that I needed. I mean, if if I wanted to come home and take a shower, I did that a couple times. I'd come home, spend the night, see my little brother and sister, take a shower feed my dog and then just leave again and he was okay with that a couple times I, I've heard also the point of view where if, if a child is going to be doing something stupid like that and you know running away from home that you shouldn't help them I've heard this expressed by a couple different people my mom is one of them don't help that don't encourage that don't give them re- things that they need don't cut off all resources that they have so that they're forced to come home out of necessity and to be honest that kind of doesn't work with me that really didn't work with me at all I was staying at this lady's house one time and um actually had to stop staying there because um, she wasn't wanted to keep encouraging me. And I put that in quotation marks, encouraging me to be homeless, when she was really just giving me a safe place to sleep until I decided to go home. Well, my dad's done the whole time that I was running away and everything was continue to support me and continue to help me and offer the things that I need and work with me and keep in touch and just let me know that I'm loved and he does want me to come home. And that totally paid off in the end. I did come home and I really appreciate what he did for me instead of turning me away and kind of trying to force me to come home because I just didn't have anything going for me, you know? I wasn't able to get services from 6th Street for a very long time, partially because of that and partially also, like I mentioned before, being a minor. 6th Street won't offer services to minors unless they can call and get parental consent, which gets complicated in situations with runaways, especially if the runaway is coming from an abusive household. I wasn't, but I know some kids, for example, who would have run away because maybe their mom was beating them or their dad was beating them or something stupid and terrible like that. So you kind of worked around that? Yeah, I had to. Maybe you could talk about that, how you applied for a job and how you like the heart program. I guess apparently what used to be the HEAR program is now the HEART program. I guess they turned into that. It's a subsidiary of, um, what is it called, Youth for Change? That's the one that that does uh, 6th Street and the HEART program. The HEART program is um, based more on the minors. 6th Street Center does services for ages 14 through 24. Well, the HEART program does services age like 13 through 18, I think. And it's um, more based on family reconciliation and counseling services and things like that. What kind of services would you like to see here in Chico that we don't have or aren't being run as properly as they could be? All right, here we go. Um, I really, really, really hope that this youth shelter becomes a thing. They said it was going to be completely anonymous, which means that the underage kids can just come and have a safe place to go. And that's awesome, and I totally support that. Another thing we need in Chico for the youth, since we're specifically talking about the youth runaways, is a free clinic. Some sort of free clinic where they can just get checkups and, you know, minor first aid stuff. I don't know how this would play in or how what kind of program this would look like or how it would get started, but some sort of resources for really young families. Because I know a lot of runaways in Chico, both male and female, who somebody ends up getting pregnant and then there's little pregnant 16 homeless girls 16 year old homeless girls with nowhere to go and no resources and no way of figuring out a foster parent sort of deal or and no way of getting back with their parents that's what the heart program i think would be really good for is the counseling aspect of that that goes back to the clinic thing some sort of free clinic for minors would be really great like a drop-in center that would actually help minors without needing parental consent you should be able to come in as a 15 year old and say i am homeless it doesn't matter how i need a sleeping bag and they should be able to give you a sleeping bag like that seems like a really simple thing when i was traveling i found a couple different places that offered stuff like that. We totally need something like that in Chico because the situation with the homeless people here is really bad. Not just the adults, but also with the minors. There's a lot of homeless youth in Chico. Surprisingly, you just don't see them. Yeah, exactly. Actually, I've talked to a lot of people about that, that one of the reasons Children Park is so cool because it's really, really cool, but you can blend in there really easy, right next to the college, right next to the high school. You've got the crowd right there with the high school kids that come to smoke their pot, and then you've got the crowd right there with the college kids who come to study and smoke their cigarettes or whatever and just hang out in their groups. And so if you're you're a little homeless kid and you look semi-clean and your backpack's not ridiculously big, you can just go down there and blend in. Nobody will ever know. Nobody will ever know. I have so many friends who are homeless right now, and nobody knows because they just blend in. And that's really cool because that eliminates a lot of the trauma. It does. It does, but, and it doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't. Explain the doesn't. Um, it's nice to be, it's nice to feel like you're seen. 
when you're homeless. A lot of the time, one of the struggles of being homeless is feeling that you're invisible and feeling that people just overlook you and like you're a little piece of dog poop that's sitting out on the sidewalk, you know? It's also nice to be recognized for what you are and celebrated for that. If Even if it's a terrible situation, it's always nice to just be seen for what it is. That's really beautiful because really the reason I was saying it's cool not to be seen is not to be... Most people that see you, they hassle you or they, they look down on you or they, they frown you. or they judge you. Or, or they just look away like you're not even there, which is almost more degrading. That's the worst. I hate that. Tell me about some of your fears and some of the things that made you fearful while you were out living under the stars. Well, I mean, what you always have to worry about when you're homeless is the cops obviously because they'll, they'll mess with you depending on where you are in the area it, they might not be that bad sometimes they'll give you a ticket sometimes they'll arrest you on the spot sometimes they'll just ask you to move and relocate did you ever get a ticket were you ever arrested no no i've been uh, picked up by the cops a couple times and they always just send me home i got picked up by the cops one night actually actually when i was in portland i was camping up in um big park up in portland which is by the portland zoo and i was camping out there by the rose gardens the cops came out in the, in the middle of the night on their buggies, and they um, swooped me up. It was me and my ex-boyfriend at the time. They wanted, they found out, I told them honestly how old I was and all this stuff, and they ran my name, found out I was a runaway, and they wanted to sign me over into the, to be a ward of the state. They actually wanted to sign me over to the Sisters of the Road, which is the foster care, homeless sort of, you know, shelter area thing there, and they totally wanted to sign me over in custody, and it was about one or two in the morning, and I had to call my dad, and it was this whole fiasco of they... I almost became, you know, a foster care kid. I almost had to actually be into the system, and that was really terrible. What saved you, so to speak? Your dad not my wanting dad. to do it? Yep. I, I said, call my father on the phone. <laughs> I swear, I just called the man, and they called the man, and he was all grumpy, and he was like, come home, blah, 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 super upset. I imagine that was really scary for him. But he convinced them, and they just let me go. How'd you feel? Did you feel relieved when it was kind of like... <sighs> I dodged the sister of the road bullet. <laughs> yes, I was so scared. That was probably mm, the most terrifying encounter I've ever had with cops. The fact that the cops had the ability and this paperwork in their hands at that moment to make me legally their ward and under their care is absolutely terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. Another thing super scary about when I was homeless is I'm very tiny. And very tiny and also um, I look female. So that's very dangerous when you're camping because you often have to camp in some really sketchy spots because that's the only place the cops won't mess with you. And then in places where the cops won't mess with you, that's where you get all the really creepy old tweakers and stuff and creepers. And I had a guy come up to me one time and go, I'll give you $5 to sleep in your bed with you. And I was like, no, go away. Leave me alone. I actually was sharing, you know, I was propositioned as a, as a male 16 standing on the street. I mean, being propositioned as a, as, a, as a homeless youth is rampant. I mean, that's proposition. But, I mean, if you're sleeping somewhere as a, a tiny woman, I mean, what did you do? What were, your, what were your skill sets to keep men from abusing you without having to get violent? I carried a really big knife. And most of the time when I was traveling, I had a really big dog. My dog Brutus was a Pipple German Shepherd Mastiff, and he was a really, really big dog. I rescued him from a super abusive person, and um, he was very loyal to me, and he was very protective. He got put down in November last year because he was also kind of out of control because of the abusive situation he came from. But he protected me, and that, that really helped. To kind of have this super aggressive-looking big dog that... Anytime somebody came within a 10-foot radius of my sleeping bag, he would sit up. Right by my sleeping bag, he would sit up, his hackles would go up, and he would growl. That deep, you know, that deep, quiet, threatening growl in the back of his throat. And that's probably the best deterrent for people that want to come over and mess with me in the night. And then it works to kind of, like, pull out my, like, fat dagger and be like, hey, I have this. How often did you have to pull out your fat dagger? Happened about four times. Yeah. And then I w they would leave, and then I would move to another spot. I never, ever, ever slept in the same spot that I thought was sketchy. Ever, ever. I've had nights where I had to get up and just walk around all night because there was nowhere to sleep. Uh, here's a fun story. I spent a night in Ashland one time, and I slept behind this um, playground-type area deep in this one park, and I woke up in the middle of the night to some drunk guy peeing on me. I didn't sleep for the whole rest of the night. <laughs> How come the dog didn't catch that one? Mm, that was after the dog got taken away from me. Oh, interesting, interesting. I think that's a beautiful story because everyone gets down on homeless dogs. We could do a whole segment on that, but they're very, very well taken care of by and large. The man who I got the dog Brutus from was, his name was Donnie, and he was um, did a lot of meth. 
you know, did a lot of heroin, was a junkie and a tweaker at the same time, did a lot of drugs, was very completely out of his mind crazy and older and had been homeless for a very long time and he used to beat this dog bloody and starve the dog and I, I I saw him leave Brutus in his shopping cart for a long time and he would just you know pee and poop through the bottom of the shopping cart and he was terrible super super abused and super super unhappy and um, after I got that dog he was really badly behaved at first and I had to train him really intensely but I got him to the point where he'd sit and he'd heal and he'd listen and he'd chill out when I told him to and he was totally loyal to me and totally listened to me the only problems he had in the end were food aggression which I'm guessing is why they put him down because dogs with food aggression aren't considered adoptable and after the highway patrol took him from me in November he got sent to the Red Bluff Pound and then they put him down after him just being there for a week now, do you mostly try to camp by yourself? No, that's not a good idea. Find your friends. If you're homeless, here's some advice. Find your friends. Um, Find other homeless people who aren't going to take advantage of you, which is hard. It is hard. But sometimes you're better off camping with somebody who may or may not be sketchy than sleeping by yourself. Because then if somebody is sketchy, you have nobody by your side. It's really important to have somebody with you. If you're in any amount of homeless camps that you're describing, you must have been witness to violence. No. Um, I leave when tensions get too high. That's how I avoided ever being the victim or, you know, perpetrator of violence when I was homeless. I just leave. Just leave. Just go somewhere else. Just take care of yourself. Um, camp with somebody else because, yes, you do need to depend on somebody else, but always be independent and always be on the move and always don't be afraid to go off on your own. If I'm camping with a group of ten people and two people decide to get in a fight and then all of a sudden it looks like everybody's about to brawl, dip out. You don't need to be there. That's not safe. Leave, leave while it still ripples and not waves. <laughs> of the time, if somebody's going to hit somebody else, it's not really about that person. It's really not. And they won't care who they hit, and they won't care who gets in the way, and they won't care. If somebody else comes to mouth off to them, they're already all hyped up in the moment. Their adrenaline's going, their fist is cocked. They'll just turn and swing on that person. So it seems like you had an amazing journey in a way because you were never beaten up, and you were never actually physically taken to jail in that one instance where they tried to put you in with Sisters of the Road. Mm -hmm. Yep. I had a, a lucky run, I guess.